movement possible, and so we're totally interested in that. The muscular system is what gives us power and stability and mobility. So by understanding how muscles work, you're going to get insight into the role that the muscles play in the yoga practice and how muscles work together to do all these things. Um, so yeah, so let's dive in. We're going to learn about the different types of muscle tissues, the structure, how they, oh, this is not telling you what they do. I'm not going to tell you that, not yet. So we're going to look at the types of muscle tissues, the structure of them, types of muscular contractions, and basically how you can tell what a muscle does just by looking at it. So you, let's, let's jump in. So what exactly is the purpose of your muscles? What, imagine your life without your muscles. You'd be a lid. Like, I want to be, be noodle. Be a noodle? Be a noodle? Be. They permit movement. They permit, so you wouldn't be able to move, right? So they permit movement. Strength. Strength. Would you have a heartbeat? No. No. There'd be no heartbeat. So what else do your muscles do? So they prevent, they help us with movement and stuff like that, but what about the muscles inside your body? Digestion, right? So there's some sort of muscles inside of you that's moving stuff, even though you're not consciously thinking about it. Like digestion. Elimination. Elimination. Pooping. Elimination. <laughs> yes. All those things. Menstruation. Ow. Yes. So what is special? So remember we talked about how there are four different types Big umbrella, step back. There's four different types of tissue in the body. That there's connective tissue, there's muscles, nerve cells, and epithelial cells. So muscle cells are like, that's a kind of specialized cell. So what makes them so special? What do you think? How are they different than, say, connective tissue? What makes muscles different? Because they can expand and contract. Yes, because they contract. So there's a lengthening and shortening thing that they can do. So because they can contract, they can produce force, and they can move stuff. That's it. So, because I actually don't know, I mean, maybe your nerves move, your nerves stretch and slide in some ways, but muscles are very specialized to produce force. All right. So, muscles. Create movement at joints. Stabilize and support the body. Maintain your posture. So you have muscles. So if your muscles weren't working right now, what would you be? What would happen to you? Dead. <laughs> You would just be a blob on the floor, right? So there are muscles clearly that are working right now, even though you're not thinking about it, to maintain you against what? What is this force? Gravity. Right, gravity. We forget about gravity. Uh, Under <laughs> right? Understandably, we forget about it all the I time. Don't. The older I get, I see it. <laughs> the older I get, the more I feel gravity. Yeah. It's true. Keeps our heart beating and moves stuff through our body. So let's look at the structure of muscles. Actually, let's look at the types of muscles. So we can divide our muscles into three types. Cardiac, smooth, and striated or skeletal. So skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. You'll see that the skeletal muscles are lined up. They're kind of like in little rows, and that's so they can pull force in the same direction. Smooth muscle isn't lined up in little rows. So it's kind of like boom, 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 boom. And then cardiac <laughs> muscle is striated. Your sound effects are the best thing about you, I'm just saying. You like sound effects. I really I do. I know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the cardiac muscle. So where do you find cardiac muscle? Around the heart. Not heart. Yes, that's right. <laughs> oh. So how do you think that these muscles might be to the cardiac muscles? Why are they different than, like, say, the muscles in your hand? Because they're exercising constantly. Yeah. Great point, Alexa. So everybody take your hand up. So how often does your heart beat? Depends on who you are. Depends on who you are. Roughly. Let's say every second. Say 78. Okay. So she's like, say hands up. Just do this. Imagine. Just do this. Right. Just keep doing this. This is the day you were born. Right. Yes. We only have one heart. So what's interesting about these is that your cardiac muscles don't... Nope, keep going. I'm not stopping it. It hasn't even been a minute. What has it been, like 20 seconds? <laughs> I'm pretty tired. Isn't that amazing? Yes. That your heart yes. is resistant to fatigue. Yeah. Like, this is what it does all day long, every day, forever. Is it fair to say that they're involunt like an involuntary sort of a muscle cell? We're still going. We're still going, I see. It's like a Kundalini class all of a sudden. Oh, I know. <laughs> Kundalini. Lucky's like, I'm out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm preventing a repetitive cycle. All right, let's go. Strong heart beat. 
You ever had a chin with down, right? So just to give you an, the difference between your skeletal muscles and your cardiac muscles is that your cardiac muscles are resistant to fatigue. They also will pulse together. The cells will pulse together when they get close to each other. Is that because it doesn't have, like, it doesn't build up lactic acid? There must be. There must, it be, must that, be But I don't know. I don't oh, know the okay, details of it. But you can go research it. I'm go, uh, yeah, about yeah. it. Tell us. <laughs> no. So they are involuntary. However, however, like many involuntary systems in the body, we can access these things indirectly. Like, how can we access our heart rate indirectly? Through breathing, right? If you sat here and started panting, you jazz yourself up, or you could slow your breath down, and that would indirectly slow your heart rate down. So we actually have some access, when we'll talk about that more in the nervous system, but we have some access to control these autonomic, automatic functions of the body, um, but through the breath, which is why the breath is so powerful and amazing in the yoga practice. So, um, yes, great. So that's the heart. So smooth muscle, so that's cardiac muscle. We're not gonna focus on that too much. Smooth muscle, right? Remember that's the blah, 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 blah. So what is smooth muscle? Where is it found? Do you think? What has to move in your body? Your gut. Your gut. Totally your gut. Where else? The joints. The joints. Well, that's more muscles, actually. Muscles. That is the muscle. Okay. That is muscle. It's more like muscles. That's going to be the skeletal muscles. This is the stuff that moves um, without you really thinking about it. Bowel. Your bowel. Bowel. Yes, uterus, ladies. Cramping, pushing babies out. That kind of thing. Um, I saw swallowing. So if you think about swallowing. What about the also, lungs? What's that? Lungs? What are the lungs doing? They're not a muscle, but they are. They're tissue. Told, but they're they're tissue. moved by your diaphragm. Right. And, and your ribs. ribs protect them. So yeah, nope, doesn't count. <laughs> nope, just talk myself out. Your arteries. Arteries. Oh, right? Yeah. So your blood vessels. You know how they have our arterial spurting? So the smooth muscle in your arteries helps to move your blood through your body. So smooth muscle is actually found like everywhere. I think it's even found in your organs, actually. It's found in those cells too. So it's in a lot of places that I thought was really weird. But basically it's designed to help things move in your body. I mean, when we think of it primarily, I think of like stomach and gut because that's kind of so obvious to us that we can actually feel it. Um, esophagus, stomach, bladder, digestive tract, blood vessels, uterus, all those kinds of places. Moving stuff in the body. And then finally we get to skeletal muscles. And this is really our focus because these are the ones that we can control voluntarily and these are the ones that are directly implicated in movement. So what would life be like if you could not contract? your muscles voluntarily. Weird. Weird, right? <laughs> yes. So we wouldn't be able to get, get, go too far too fast, right? So these are important for facilitating movement at joints, it's important for our general stability, and it also helps to support like our orifices, like, you know, thinking about the sphincters of whatever that you're, so that you can control your pelvic floor. You can control those kinds of things, like controlling what comes in and what comes out of your body. And it does offer some protection, like for example, your abdominals. Like it's very thin though, I have to be honest, your abdominals are very thin. It's not very good protection. Your spine and your ribs are much better for protecting you. But there is some sort of protection, you know, against your, your internal organs. It's not just skin and then internal organs. You do have a layer of muscles here. So they create movements at joints, support your organs and orifices, support posture and stability, and they offer some protection. So here is a picture of someone who's got really nice skeletal muscles. So they can be built with effort and time. And they can atrophy very fast. And they can atrophy. Has anyone had a cast? Oh my god. Yes? yes? So tell us what happened. Well, I was 15 and I had been playing basketball for like a couple of years and all of a sudden my knee, I think it was my left knee, there was something wrong. Keep in mind this was in the 70s and they probably would have treated like this now. So I went to the doctor and he said, we have to completely immobilize your leg. Mm. So all summer, I had a cast from here oh, God. to here. All oh, summer. so you couldn't bend your knee. I couldn't even bend my knee. So I think, I think he put it at a slight little sort of angle. I couldn't do anything. And it was on for about eight weeks. And then literally when I took that cast off, well, first of all, my leg was white. But secondly, it looked like it, it was almost half the size of my other leg. Like it was, it was literally like, that and I got really scared because I thought, oh my god, like how am I ever going to build that up to be the same as the other one? And again, nowadays, like this, this is going back to like 1978 or something. 
Um, they probably wouldn't do that to isolate it like that, you know, to have a joint heal up. And honestly, I don't think there was anything really wrong with my knee other than it was like probably fatigued and I, I probably needed to rest it and maybe get, you know, um, maybe a cortisone injection or something. But it was really, it was kind of frightening how small the muscle got. Yes. Yeah. Like it's not just here, but also here. But there's also, yeah, and that's another example of, of, well, of how much your, your body's actually working in space all the time against gravity. Because again, we don't think about it, but that's an amazing example to see that. But then also how resilient and how much we can actually change our bodies, mm -hmm. right? Like you did build that back up. Yeah. You don't look lopsided now, no. right? So yeah. it's, it's really amazing. And I think it was fairly quick, because I think within the next couple of months, I think my grade 10 or grade 11 started up, I started playing basketball again. Yeah, it was a little bit weak, but I didn't really remember it looking like that for too, too long, like maybe three or four months, if that. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Like, um, we, are the, we are the species that like, can change ourselves, adding tattoos, you know, choosing to diet in a certain way, choosing to take in certain food or not take in certain food to change the shape of our bodies. Like, we really, it's really amazing how the body is responsive to what we do to it. Muscle mass is hard to maintain as you age too. I can say from years of being in bodybuilding and weightlifting in my 50s now, it takes, oof, if I take a couple weeks off, oof, it a lot of You feel it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You lose muscle mass faster as you age. Uh, even just not coming to a practice for a week at the age of 28, I yeah. feel it back. You can feel it too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Totally. This is why our a daily you know, practice. In the Yoga Sutras, it says that your practice needs to be consistent for a long time with devotion. Mm -hmm. And that consistency is important. Like, better to get to your mat for 15 minutes a day, every day, than for like an hour every week, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. Let's look at how muscles work. So we touched on this actually a little bit with connective tissue, but so here we have individual muscle fiber surrounded by fascia. Those are bundled together, surrounded by fascia. Those are bundled together, surrounded by fascia. And then that's all stuck onto a bone, basically. And then there's a, there's the nervous system causes a chemical reaction in our body that causes the muscles to contract. So this is like with, you know, potassium and calcium. And I don't remember the details. <laughs> What point I used to understand it, but basically some sort of chemical reaction happens based on your nerve impulse and that causes the muscle to contract. And then when you, because muscles are striated, that is they're bundled together, as you can see in the same kind of like in the same shape, when you have a whole bunch of them that contract together, then that causes force, right? So like one muscle fiber contracting isn't going to do anything, but they actually contract as a group. Um, yeah. And so it's kind of like, if you've eaten a grapefruit or an orange, the way you can, uh, this is kind of a nice analogy for those muscle cells, you know how you have like um, the smallest little piece of juice surrounded, like surrounded by the little connective tissue thing, and then you have bigger pieces surrounded by a little connective tissue, and then you have a little slice of orange surrounded by its little sleevey of connective tissue, and that's all surrounded by its little connective tissue, and then it's surrounded by the rind. Well, it's kind of like what your muscles are. So these tiny little bits are surrounded, and then that's surrounded, and then that's surrounded. And then you eat it, and it's delicious. <laughs> so muscle activation. So skeletal muscles have two places that they insert. So remember that all movement happens at joints. So a skeletal muscle will cross at least one, some, some of them cross two joints, and will influence movement at that joint by moving your bones. So they attach on one end, and then they attach on the other end. Um, sometimes those are called origin and insertion. Like kind of, usually the origin is closer to the midline of the body, because usually, generally, we're moving the something that's further weight towards us, but not always. Like, you know, I could do this, or I could do this, and it's like the same thing that's happening. All right, so I like to think of them as just two insertion points, rather than, you know, so either end could move, basically. So when a muscle activates, what it does is it contracts to the center. So whatever it's attached to is going to pull in. So for example, in this, you can see we got the bicep. So it attaches here and here. And so if these two points, if you imagine me with little sticky dots, if these two points pull closer to each other, it's going to flex my elbow. Make sense? Okay. So and the thing about muscles is that they can only, when they activate, they can only contract. Okay, all they can do is, all they can do is pull against each other, all they can do is shorten. So muscles can't actively lengthen. 
So muscles have to work in pairs. So for example, actually let's look at this picture again. So here's my bicep, right? It contracts and that makes my elbow bend. Now the bicep can't just decide to push apart. Muscles only pull. So there has to be an opposing muscle, which is this one. What's this called? Tricep. Your tricep. That can then contract to open it back up again. So these two muscles work opposite each other. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the muscle that is shortening is called the agonist. It's the primary mover. And the muscle that is lengthening to allow it is the antagonist. So if you imagine here with me with my bicep, this is shortening, that means that the back of my arm has to actually lengthen. Otherwise it would just be, otherwise I would just be in the same length, right? If this decided not to lengthen and this was contracting, I'd be working hard, but nothing would change shape, right? So one has to contract and then one has to lengthen in order to um, allow that movement to happen at the joint. A synergist is just a name for a muscle that kind of stabilizes around in order to help per permit that movement to happen. So one of the things that I think is kind of, um, can be kind of confusing. All right, um, I actually talked about this a little bit. Um, reciprocal inhibition, so let's just actually take this concept here and apply it to yoga. Reciprocal inhibition means that when one muscle contracts, the other has to let go. So sometimes this can be when the agonist activates, the antagonist releases. So for example, if I am doing a uh, forward fold, which is why I was so interested to hear about the tendon. Because usually if you contract one set of muscles, the other set is going to release. So is that still true? Yeah. So if I'm doing a forward fold and I want my hamstrings to be more open, if you contract the quads, that'll actually send a signal like, hey guys, you guys are supposed to let go now, right? So usually in yoga, you'll often hear when we're in forward folds, it's like engage your legs. Well, it's because we like to usually keep balance anyways, but actually engaging your quads will help open the backs of your legs and open your hamstrings up. Is this yes? Good. Just making sure I'm current, everybody. Okay. Good. So that's something when I, when I first did my teacher training, they were like, you could actually use this in the yoga class to help people stretch their bodies. So here's something that I wanted to talk about. Muscle contraction. Activity versus length. So the word contraction... People say, oh, a muscle's contracting. I think it's a little confusing because when I hear the word contraction, I think shortening. Mm -hmm. Contraction sounds like shortening to me, but that's not kind of officially what it means. What they really mean is that it's engaging or working. The muscle is working, right? So a muscle can work and either be contracting or shortening. It can be working and be lengthening, or it can be working and staying the same length. Does that make sense? So when I hear the official term muscle contraction, to me that's just a little confusing. So we want to say the muscle is activating or the muscle is working and either shortening, lengthening, or staying the same. So concentric contraction, as it's called, is when a muscle is working and it's shortening. So example, the bicep, if I'm holding on to a heavy weight, Right? And I contract my bicep, I make my bicep work, and it's pulling these two ends closer to each other. The muscle is working, it's engaged, and it's getting shorter. That's called concentric contraction. Imagine for a moment that I'm still holding this heavy weight, though, and now I'm going to slowly bring it down. What's happening to the length of my bicep? Elongated. Does that make sense? It's actually getting longer. But is it working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can be working and lengthening, and that is called eccentric contraction. And usually, and this is why gravity is so important, is because usually we're working a lot in gravity, and so we have to remember that gravity is always like trying to push us in one direction and we're always resisting it. So sometimes we're working in gravity and we're not realizing it. And when we look at yoga postures, we'll see that a little bit more. So we'll circle back to that. Um, so our muscles are always resisting gravity to some extent. So let's think about, you guys, let's think about um, the transition from plank to chaturanga, for example. So eccentric contraction is often what happens when we are resisting the fall into gravity. Like, for example, gravity is pushing us into something or there's some sort of force that's pushing down on us. 
we're resisting it to slow that down. Something is lengthening, but it's working against the force of gravity. So I'm gonna have you do a little brainstorm and get into like groups of threes and think about in the transition from plank to chaturanga or plank to the floor, if you do it slow, you don't just plunk down, what, what's going on? Which muscle is really working? And we'll just say in your arms or shoulders, which muscle is really working and what is it doing? So I want you to just go and puzzle that out. And if you know the answer immediately, then maybe let your cohorts try to puzzle it out. Okay, off you go. Well, there's two muscles involved. Okay. The bicep and the tricep. Right. So when we're going from plank down to chaturanga, yes. the tricep is in concentric contract. Is it well let's look at it. Is it lengthening? So the tricep is going from here to here. So it attaches here to here. So is this lengthening or shortening? Shortening. It's lengthening. Right? I'm taking the end of it away. Yeah, so it's working, but it's lengthening at the same time. It's going, so if you, everyone extend your arm out straight like this. Engage, what do you feel engaging when you straighten your arm fully? Your tricep, your tricep yeah. So then you're like, oh, okay, that's contracted. So when we're doing this, it's lengthening, but because we have all of the weight of our body and gravity, it's lengthening, but it's working. It's like resisting the fall. Yeah. Like if I were just in plank and I didn't do anything, I would just bend my elbows and fall down. But the, tri the triceps like breaking that action, working against gravity. So it, that's why our triceps get so freaking strong in yoga, because we're always doing this nonsense, this nonsense tricep push-up thing, rather than a nice pec push-up, which is wider and so much easier. Have you guys tried this? Oh yes. Good. Come on, come on to your knees for a sec. Come on. Oh. Okay. So knees down, knees down, hands down. Bring your hands slightly forward, and bring your shoulders over your wrist. So it's always call a modified push-up. Not a girl's push-up. Yeah, it's a level, yeah. This, this is a manly push-up. Bring your shoulders over your wrists. Now you'll let your, your elbows, you guys, I don't really care about, I don't actually like cueing so much from squeeze the elbows in, but press the inner edges of your hands down, draw your shoulders onto your back, and then letting the elbows move pretty much generally straight back, exhale lower just halfway down and hold. Do you guys feel your triceps? Yes. Good, good, press back up. Now take your hands wide, wider than your shoulders. Let your elbows go wide and lower halfway down and then press back up. What do you feel working there? Uh, Isn't that so much better? Let's just ch let's change yoga. Let's do all pec push-ups. So much better. Okay. All right, but yes, you guys got it. Triceps, which is why in yoga we do all tricep push-ups like all the time. Okay, isometric. If I'm just out there holding on, the muscle is working. It's working, right? Imagine yourself holding a stack of books like this little kid. Something's working, right? Right, but it's, is it changing length? No. No, right? So that's it, that's called isometric, iso meaning same, right? So it's an isometric contraction, nothing is changing length. That's like when you hold, when we held dolphin plank today. Well, you weren't there, but we did in the hot practice, we held dolphin plank for 75 seconds. Sure. Yeah, yeah, same, anytime you're static. Oh, okay. Anytime you're not moving. So yoga, we do tons of this. We do tons of getting into warrior two and just holding you there. Which is why when we're like, what's working? You're like, everything. <laughs> Everything's working. Right? So isometric, yes. Isometric is when the muscles are working, but they're not changing length. So there's no perceptible at movement from the outside, and yet you're like, I'm sweating. Right? But they've done work to get there. They did some sort of they did some like concentric. They're working to hold there. you. But yes. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I'm, now I'm isometric. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Exactly. Work. When there's movement, something has to be something has to be contracting exactly. But when you're holding, it's like working but not changing length. But the the point I guess is that's exactly right is that it's really working. Yes. It's hard work. Burn a lot of calories, holding dolphin plank, or chair, getting angry. <laughs> right? It's like yeah. Okay. So where do we where in yoga do we often see a lot of isometric contractions? What are poses we love to just hold? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, chair pose is another one. All of them. Oh, yeah. all, of them. <laughs> We're so, all of them. It's so true. Okay, so here's... Hmm? Tadasana. it's true. So here's... Yeah, and actually, interestingly enough, I think this is interesting. In yoga, we do teach people to, to be active. Like, for example, when you're just standing in Tadasana, you could stand there and just be like, meh. Right? But when we do our universal actions, we're teaching, we're actually creating an engagement through the body. 
we're asking the muscles to work, not change length, but to work in a way so that we find more activation, energy, prana, all of that stuff, not just hanging out. Um, this fine fellow, uh, <laughs> now this is something that I think is really, really cool. So even though you're going to learn some names of some muscles and things like that as we go along, you don't have to know the names of any muscles in order to know exactly what they do. So that's a big relief. You don't actually have to know what they're called. It doesn't really, the names don't really matter so much. <laughs> when you look at this guy, you can see, you can figure out, if you know where a muscle sticks into a bone, you can figure out what it's gonna do. You just imagine, hey, it's a mechanical world. What happens if those two points come closer together? For example, we have this big old muscle here, which runs from the center of the chest out to the inner arm. So if those two points come closer, what is it going to do? Shorten. So it's the it's going to shorten. Concentric. It is a concentric. So what's going to happen to my arm? Pulling. It's going to go like this, right? It's going to be that pec push-up that we just did, right? Make sense? So everyone stand up for a sec. OK. So let's imagine if we have a sticky dot here, this is the deltoid. It's called the deltoid. It's very pretty. So here and here, what is the action of this muscle going to do? So this guy. What is it going to do to your arm? Go ahead and show me. If those two points come closer together. Exactly. Right? It's going to bring your arm out to the side. If we have a sticky dot here and here, which is your rectus abdominis, what is the action going to do there? Yeah, tilt your pelvis and flex your spine. Right? If you have a sticky dot, right? or it's going to hold you against gravity, as it does when you're in Navasana. Right? This is holding you. Or when you're in camel pose like you guys were today, gravity is pushing you this way. If gravity had its way with you, you would just go back. But your body's like, no thank you. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So this is like a little sling that's actually working. It's why you can feel your core so much in camel pose if you don't put your hands back. Right? This is working to hold you. Eccentric contraction, right? It's lengthening, but it's working. What about if you had a sticky dot here and here? What would the action of that muscle be? Your knee would have to start bent, and then when it totally, when it straightens, right? So this is why soccer players have such good quads. If I have a sticky dot here and here, what would the action of this be? Yeah. Yeah, what's that? It could. It could pull me this way, right? It could also lift this end up. So no, but yes, exactly. It can act on either end, right? Make sense? So here's the moral of the story, friends, is that you don't actually, when you look at your anatomy book, you don't actually have to know the names of the pose. You just have to use your common sense and say, OK, what if these two points got closer? What two bones are they going to be moving? Say I have a sticky dot here and here. This crosses two joints, right? It's crossing my hip joint and it's crossing my knee. What's that muscle going to do? What do you guys show me? Yeah. So it, it can do this. So guys, lift your leg up for a sec. So it, this is the first half of it, but it also slings down here and so it can also straighten your leg. So you know in the, keep it up, so you know in the hot practice when you, your quad starts to bite you, when you're like, why does this hurt so much? The reason why it hurts so much or twinges so much is because it's in its fullest contraction. It's, that's like as contracty as it can get, so that's why it's talking to you. It's like, you really want to hold this? We're really contracted, you really want to hold this? We have another one like that. It starts at our sitting bone and it goes down to the backs of our legs. So what is the action of that muscle going to do? Yeah, it can take your leg back, and then what else can it do? Exactly. It can bend your knee. So when you see a muscle crossing a joint, you go like, OK, what is the action if, it, if those two bones pull closer together? If it crosses two joints, it's the same question. It's like, OK, well, what are the actions that it can do at each joint? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? Yeah, so when I, when I watch you do that, like you guys are in that perfect L shape. Like, I can barely get that. Is that only based on tight muscles and lots of lack of flexibility? Is that all that is? It might be the muscle's ability to contract. Yeah. So is that just flexibility? 
I'm actually not sure. It might also be muscle strength. What do you think? It could be both. I think yeah. it could be one thing. It could yeah. be both. It could be or the joint shape, shape. Like, like joint yeah. shape yeah. to be able to lift your. Yeah. Yeah. That's especially out to the side, right? Yeah. I think. But I, over time, like I used to be here going, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. lift it higher. I can't. And now I, I can go a little bit higher. Yeah, and so I don't have the mobility right? in the back here, like between so these two points, the insertion on both sides of that hip. It's your turn. Uh, we'll just go. Yeah, done. Okay. All right. So one thing I want to touch base on is proprioception. What is proprioception? It's a pretty word. It's a pretty word. It's all the feedback that's going on from the muscles to help you maintain a certain position in space or to know where, with my eyes closed, I know my hand is up or down. Or, feedback from muscle yeah. to brain? Yeah. Don't know where your body is in space. Don't know where your body is in space. Great. Everyone take your arms out to the side. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Touch your nose. Don't you miss. <laughs> I know. I like Everyone's like subconscious now. Okay. Take, do it with the other hand. See if one's better. So one thing that gets affected if you've been drinking is your proprioception. Hence, touch. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Walk in a straight line. <laughs> You're like, I don't know where I am, right? So it's our ability to sense ourselves in space and know where we are in space. And it, it's, related, um, it's related to our brain through, from our muscles by feedback regarding tension and length. This also has to do with our inner ear, I would imagine, which has to do with balance too, I would say. And vision. And vision. Um, so proprioception is what allows these people to do this, this crazy thing. They have a really heightened ability to know where they are in space. So two of the different basically receptors, and these are nerves in your muscles that help give us information, are the ones that give us feedback about how long a muscle is and then how much tension it's under. So your muscle spindle fibers are proprioceptors that convey information about how much it's stretched. So when a muscle gets too far, gets too stretchy, too far, too fast, the muscle's going to be like, uh-uh, because if it goes too far, too fast, it's going to rip. And then it's like, no, that's a bad idea, right? So then it contracts to prevent that from happening which is why you get whiplash. So when we have whi whiplash, the back of the neck gets stretched too far too fast and it actually contracts back and so that your head doesn't fly off, which is probably good, but causes problems. Have I described that yeah. accurately? Okay. <laughs> You're like grateful that your head didn't fall off your neck, but at the same time, now you have whiplash, right? So it's not so much that, it's the <laughs> pulling back to prevent it. The other one is a Golgi tendon organ. I don't know these names are so crazy. But that's the one that when the muscle is under a lot of strain, it lets it go. So imagine this. Here's a story. You're rock climbing. Has anyone seen Solo Climb? Yes. <gasps> I have to. I've only watched the preview. I'm like scared, but I have to watch it. It's about this guy who free climbs. Uh, what is it called? I can't remember, but it's terrifying. You know, the Yosemite yeah. rock face. Don, Don free Wall? climb, though. Free climb. No ropes. No ropes. The, is it the dome wall? The, the dome, half dome. Yeah. Yeah. He free climbs that. Crazy. It's freaking nuts. Anyway, so imagine you're this dude free climbing, okay? You get to a spot and your fingers start to get tired and they start to shake. Now, it is not in your best interest to let go, right? And yet, at some point, if you get tired enough, you will not be able to help yourself but let go because your muscles are going like, this is too much strain, too much strain, and you kind of wish you had an evolutionary override in your brain to say, don't let go, and yet they're gonna have too much strain on them, and they say, no, because we're gonna break, so you're letting go. It's like when you hold books and your arms start shaking, and then you drop them and you can't help it. The muscles are like, nope, we're working too much. It's too much tension. Did he let go? He survived. Oh. Yeah, no, he did not let go. He, he made it, yeah, but everyone was... Well, I'm just talking, I'm only talking about this. Report, go watch and report back. Okay. So one of the things, have you guys ever heard of PNF stretching? Proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So basically what that means is that when you put tension on a muscle, and then you, and it doesn't have to be crazy amounts. Like I used to think you'd have to like lean on them like crazy, but it's not that, she's like, no, but it's not that much tension. But then you put tension on a muscle, like they activate the muscle, it tends to release a little bit more by kind of using your nervous system to facilitate the stretch. So if you don't have a hamstring injury, you can play with this with a partner. So does anybody not have a hamstring injury who wants to kind of try this? 
Want to try? Sure. Okay, come lay down. I think now that you say, okay, when you said PNF, I didn't know what that was, but I think like in dance you would do that. Yeah, yeah. You do this. Oh, yeah, they're just nutsy in dance. So put your heel up, and I'm just going to have you press against it. Yeah, exactly. So she'll work against it. She's strong. <laughs> good. And then just release. And then stop working. And then on here. Okay. So good. And then she'll, this is good for your Hanuman. And then push again. Like, I'm just resisting her. She's tough. So, like, for three. How, just how long do you have to do it for? Maybe for five seconds. Five seconds. Okay. Two, one. And then release. And maybe a little further. Maybe. Oh. Oh my. <laughs> okay, good. so if you have to be, now this is part of, I'm just gonna hold on to your foot for a sec. This is part of hands-on assist in the sense that one of the first things that's really important about hands-on assist is your ability to listen. Your ability to feel. Like you may not do this ever to students in class, but right now what you're going to be doing, you would never do this probably to students in class. But I mean, regardless of whether or not you decide to practice hands-on assist as part of your future teaching career, Right now, this is an opportunity to be really sensitive to your partner. So I'm not pushing. I'm letting her lead it, and I'm just kind of following her, right? So I'm just offering her my hand to push into. She's pushing into my hand. And then when she lets go after a count, I'm actually letting her, I'm just following her lead and being really sensitive. So you're not just practicing this PNF stretching just as kind of a cool thing to try. It's also about how do I listen to what their body is telling me. And you, as my partner, have to tell me, nope. Yeah. yeah, right? Sound okay? <laughs> Wanna try it? <laughs> I know, okay, good. Okay, find a partner. Um, if you don't have an injury, and if you have an injury, that's okay, you can try it on someone and then not have it done to you. Okay, so now let's look at just like, uh, let's look at some common injuries that may come up with muscles. So basically we're looking at muscle strains. So this is a hamstring strain, pretty nasty one. Muscles, remember, are very vascular, and so basically this muscle, we have a big bruise, right? Uh, a hamstring strain on the back of the thigh, a lot of bruising, which is blood not being where it's supposed to be. Um, so muscle strains, just like sprains, so a sprain, remember, was an injury to the ligament. When we overstretch a ligament, a strain is an injury to your muscles. So hockey, I always hear about, like, strained groin. <laughs> injuries, things like that. Um, so they can have varying degrees of severity. This one looks pretty bad. Um, but usually they heal pretty well because what do muscles have that connective tissue doesn't often? Yes, right. So unlike ligaments, muscles have good vascular supply, which means they heal more quickly. So a twitch or a cramp um, is also something that can happen. And sometimes this happens in hot. Some people get heat cramps or things like that um, from dehydration or lack of mineral salts. Um, so it's an involuntary muscle contraction, basically a twitch. Um, in this photo, the muscle of the hand is contracted. So, you know, sometimes various things can cause a muscle cramp. Usually, if it's just not a big deal, it can be relieved, like a Charlie horse can be relieved by gentle stretching. Um, and sometimes it's caused by like some nerve compression, something like that. It can be. It can be exacerbated by things like dehydration or like, in, this is why hot practice, sometimes people get crampy. Kristen Campbell used to tell me stories about how people would, their fingers would cramp in class and so they would give them electrolytes and water and then they would be okay. But right, kind of, yes, so dehydration can play a role in that. So neuromuscular disorders too, like, and this was kind of, Liz, what you were talking about earlier with, like, you were in a cast and your muscle atrophied, but neuromuscular disorders, you know, problems with the nervous systems and actually contracting the muscles, that could lead to also muscle problems. You're not going to really see, well, you might see some of this kind of stuff in yoga class. Usually this would be more of a chronic thing. Um, like examples of neuromuscular disorders are like Huntington's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, things like that. So, all right. So get into your groups, twos or threes, and take a little stroll through your student review. Um, and then we'll come back in about 10 minutes.